So a real informal video today. Uh, I've had some people ask me how it's going uh, with the 90 day backlog challenge. And so we're going to give you a bit of an update on that and also drop a couple of opinions about some things that have been going around on Twitter. So uh, yeah, let's get started. With the 90 day backlog challenge, for those of you who don't know, maybe this is your first time on the channel or the first time hearing about it. If that's the case, please subscribe down below. There's all kinds of great content. Check out some of the older videos on the channel. Hit the like button if you would, because it helps out an absolute ton. Anyways, the 90 day backlog challenge is for me a system where I am uh, making myself more accessible to a lot of these older games that I have in my collection that I have just never gotten around to playing. Everybody's got the backlog problems if you're a video game collector. You've got dozens or hundreds of games that you just haven't had the time to get around to. So what I did was I took 90 days and I decided I am not going to buy any new games in that 90 day period except for things that I already had pre-ordered because, you know, I'm kind of committed to buy them at this point. But, uh, you know, so in that 90-day period, I divided that up into 12 weeks plus a few days and chose 12 video games that I have been really meaning to get to and just never had the time to get around to. And the idea is I'm going to play each of these 12 games 30 minutes or more per day for one week. So I started off uh, the 90-day challenge uh at the beginning, well, I guess it was the 11th of April, with Destroy All Humans, uh, the remake on the Xbox One. I have it now, and it is coming out for the Switch as well, and I'm pretty excited for that because I think I'd rather play it on the Switch and handheld, but I'm playing it on the Xbox One for now. I had a little bit of a hard time with this game. I set myself up a system here on this calendar. I don't know how well you can see it, but uh, a red X means I did not play on the first day, and the reason why I did not play on the first day is because the darn thing needed to update, and uh, it took, like, all day, because my internet's super slow, so I missed the first day. The two gold stars here mean that I meant that I played for more than my 30 minutes, considerably more than my 30 minutes, to get that gold star. The red stars mean I just hit that 30 minutes, so I played for about four hours this week. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed it, but I wasn't in the mood for that kind of game. Destroy All Humans is awesome. Um, it's got a lot of stealth mechanics in the different missions and things like that, and a lot of different objectives, and a lot of learning curve from level to level to level. There's a lot of variety in the gameplay, and I just really wasn't feeling like that much of a learning curve although like the game is not difficult by any means and it's super fun it's hilarious the graphics are beautiful i just wasn't really in the mood but that is something that i will go back to eventually week two uh i moved on to zelda Link's awakening uh, a game that I pre-ordered when it came out when I didn't even own a Switch. I wanted to play it so badly, and I got my hands on the Dreamer Edition, which you can probably see in the background here somewhere. Uh, I finally got around to playing it. Um, I enjoy it. It's very cute, but my experience with older Zelda games is pretty small. I played the original Zelda on the NES way back in the day. Uh, you know, I played a fair bit of it. I never beat it, but I did enjoy it. And that kind of... I've never really played a top-down uh, Zelda like that since. And the, the whole kind of idea of Zelda being this mission of discovery and this kind of running back and forth trying to find some secret hidden under a rock somewhere to unlock some something so that you can move on... I wasn't really prepared for that kind of, uh, you know, deep digging. I did get into a couple of walkthroughs and get through the first sort of three or four parts of the game. Uh, I did manage to play it pretty consistently the whole week, and I think I will go back to this eventually and finish it because it is cute and charming, and it is a lot of fun, but I wasn't really prepared for the, the deep, thinking of trying to solve all these puzzles and figure out all the secrets and clues. Now we get to this week, and this week has been a ton of fun for me because I am on Crash Bandicoot 4. 
Uh, Crash Bandicoot 4 on my Xbox One looks amazing, and they did a fantastic job with this game. It is so spot on. The controls are amazing, but oh my god, this thing is difficult. I have played consistently for 45 minutes to an hour each day. I've progressed through several levels, but it is not uncommon for, for me to take 20 to 30 minutes to complete one level. Uh, the platforming is hard, man. Some of those sections where you're going over like a hundred foot gap with nothing but breakable blocks in between, and uh, you know you break, 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 and then fall through the crack or something like uh, that. It's pretty extreme platforming, and uh, it is really difficult. But the great thing about it is it feels like it's your fault when you die. It doesn't feel like the game is broken. It doesn't feel you know. It, it spurs you to keep going and going and going, and on some of these days this week, I have sat down and I have died 40 or 50 times trying to get through a level. Uh, I, you know, I don't know why I'm so bad at this. I used to be pretty good at Crash Bandicoot back in the day, but, uh, you know, I have managed to complete the level after sitting there and dying 20, 30, 40 times. I've managed to complete level after level after level, and I'm really enjoying it. So, how's the 90 Day Backlog Challenge going so far? I would say this has been a really interesting experiment for me. It's very hard for me not to go out and buy new games. Uh, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do is thrift store hunting and, uh, you know, going in and out of gaming stores and pawn shops and things like that. It has helped, however, that we're in a lockdown at the moment, so there's really nowhere for me to go. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so what, uh, you know, I'm gonna finish up Crash Bandicoot 4 this week. Well, I'm not gonna finish the game, obviously, but this game is the first in the challenge so far that I am going to keep playing while I play other games in the challenge. I expect to play this pretty much every day going forward until I either beat it or just get, you know, overwhelmed by the difficulty, whichever comes first. Next week... Uh, we're moving into a whole new month, the month of May. And for the month of May, we have Metal Slug Anthology, which I have right here, and I'm really excited to get into this one. Um, I, you know, I enjoyed Metal Slug back in the day in the arcades. I played this a little bit when I bought it. Uh, I really love these games, and I'm going to start at the beginning and get as far as I can get next week. Uh, the week after, we're moving into DuckTales Remastered, which uh, I've played the first few levels of. I have it physically as well as digitally on my PS3, uh, and it's just high time that I'm actually going to try and beat that game because it is fairly easy to beat in a week if you put a couple hours a day into it. So I'm going to do my best on DuckTales Remastered. Uh, then we move into Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, which I bought last year when it launched and played the first 45 minutes of it, maybe, and never went back to it. Uh, Hollow Knight and Mario Odyssey to round out next month. So let's see how that goes. I'm really enjoying this format of forcing myself to give these games enough attention to decide whether I really want to beat them. You know, I don't have this notion in my head that I have to platinum every single game I own. I don't feel guilty about owning games that I don't play. However, things on my channel have been changing over the last two months. I made a video uh, which probably several of you have seen with several of my friends, Smash JT, Papa Pete, Fem Trooper, where we talked about collecting retro games becoming pointless. And while it is not pointless to correct, collect retro games, there are several things I love about it. I have decide, decided to refine my collection, and so I have actually gotten rid of a ton of games. There was another video I did talking about spring cleaning where I got rid of about 100 or 120 of my PS1 and PS2 games. I actually traded them in for a brand new Nintendo Switch, which I am enjoying the heck out of. Uh, I only had the Switch Lite previously, and now I have the Animal Crossing full-size Switch, and it's so great to be able to play on the TV now. I'm experiencing games in a whole new way. Recently, I, uh, uh, now, PK, if you're watching this video, don't shoot me, brother. 
but I have been looking for ways to reduce my collection and make it more accessible to me. I have too much stuff that I never play. So a couple of months ago, uh, my oldest daughter, Lily, you've seen her on the channel before, she asked me if she could borrow or have my Wii U. And uh, I gladly sent it to her. Uh, she lives across the country from me, so I don't see her a whole lot right now. Uh, I gladly sent it to her, and I sent a couple of games with it, Pikmin 3 and Mario Maker and something else I can't remember. But uh, I've been without my Wii U now for the last two or three months, and it started to dawn on me that with how much I love the Switch and with how many games had been ported over to the Switch at this point, virtually everything that I would want to play is now accessible on the Switch uh, or you know, in other ways, digital downloads, that sort of thing. The only game that I can really think of that I absolutely love, and it is actually my favorite game on the Wii U, and that is Xenoblade Chronicles X. That has not been ported as of yet. But I do have faith with the success of the Xenoblade franchise that Chronicles X will be ported to the Switch at some point. So I decided to let my Wii U collection go. I sent another seven or eight games that I thought my daughter would really enjoy. I sent them to her. Uh, of the 15 or 20 games that I had left, I took a few and traded them to uh, my son, Kaz, who's been on the channel plenty of times. He really enjoys the Wii U as well. And he and I kind of trade things back and forth so that we can keep our collections in the family, but keep them focused on things that we particularly love. So, you know, a couple years ago, I, uh, I sold him my Dreamcast, and then I kind of got it back from him and trade for something else. Uh, now, the Wii U games, most of the good ones have gone to him, and he's going to buy me physical copies. Well, he actually owns a physical copy of Atelier Ryza, which he did not really enjoy. And I absolutely love Atelier Ryza. He's giving me his copy, which is worth upwards of, you know, $130 to $150 Canadian. And then he's actually going to go out and buy me a copy of Atelier Ryza 2, which is, you know, still a kind of a $60, $70 game brand new right now while it's available, so I'll have those two games to add to my collection that I really do care about and that I will play, and the Wii U stuff now is gone. I took maybe six or seven games that were just kind of filler titles uh, to my local store and traded them in and put the credit towards a layaway that I've got going uh, right now because I am working my way towards getting Fire Emblem Path of Radiance on the GameCube. So the libraries that really mean something to me right now are the Wii and the GameCube, and then the Switch, the 3DS, the DS, and as far as outside of Nintendo, I have a healthy collection of Xbox All Generations, which... Uh, you know, I'm going to keep mostly because of the backwards compatibility support that Microsoft has been so great with. So I can carry those games forward onto newer platforms, which I absolutely love. I absolutely love what Microsoft is doing with Game Pass and with backwards compatibility. So, you know, here's the thing. Sony has really let me down recently. You know, there are a few exclusive games that I would love to play on, say, the PS4, but I sold my PS4 Pro to Kaz a couple of years ago, and I don't regret it. Uh, I'm much happier with my Xbox One S. 99% uh, of the time, there are a few exclusives on the PlayStation platform that I would love to play, but when I decide to get around to that, I will borrow back my PS4 from Kaz, played a couple of games for a couple of months, and then give it back to him. So uh, PS3, I absolutely love, and I pretty much have everything I want uh, on the PS3 library, aside from a few of the more expensive ones that I'm just kind of picking my way through. PS2, I massively downsized and only kept stuff that was either a personal favorite of mine or stuff that I thought would grow in value. PS1, I've pretty much got myself out of because I do have the PS1 Mini uh, along with a bunch of those True Blue hack sticks, so I have most of the library digitally that I can play uh, on the PS1 Mini for the, you know, 
tiny amount of time I spend playing PS1. I really only have a handful of games that I think are worth going back to on the PS1 for the most part. Sure, it's a great library, but I do find it a little bit dated at this point. I find a lot of the controls in the early 3D games to be really clunky and stuff. So I just don't really enjoy going back that far. I really like that kind of 7th generation area, the 360, the PS3, the Wii, uh, you know, or going back to the GameCube. Like, that's kind of where I really enjoy spending my gaming time. And, of course, the Switch is perfect for that because the Switch does a lot of ports of older games. And, you know, the graphical style of a lot of the games on the Switch remind me of stuff from that era just because of the Switch's capabilities. Anyway, I am rambling a little bit, but yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into Metal Slug Anthology uh, next week here and moving further through the challenge. Uh, there's been a lot of talk online recently about games being review bombed and that sort of thing and some really crazy reviews and stuff. I saw something yesterday I think it was yesterday or the day before, gosh, what was it? Uh, yeah, movie reviews where, uh, you know, uh, something happened on, I guess it was Metacritic or something, where, you know, an amazing movie like Citizen Kane uh, moved down a little bit and was replaced by Paddington Bear 2 as one of the best movies ever made. These rating systems are so broken like can you imagine putting a movie like Paddington Bear I don't care how good it is it's Paddington frickin Bear it has you know it's not even in the same like stratosphere as something like Citizen Kane or The Empire Strikes Back or The Wizard of Oz or any of these amazing The Godfather The Matrix like you know those movies are on another level, and it's the same with games now, where we're seeing these crazy reviews come out where, you know, a game that is pretty mediocre is getting, you know, 85s, and then, you know, fantastic games that have the smallest little problem or some kind of social thing that people don't like are getting bombed and they're getting 50s and stuff, and it's unbelievable. And it brings to point, I was talking to somebody on Twitter today, where, you know, I don't even engage with those platforms anymore. I do not trust Metacritic. I do not trust IGN. I do not trust any of these big review sites. Uh, I now, and for quite a while, have begun to trust YouTubers who have proven themselves uh, to have the same tastes and the same opinions about games in general as I do. So looking at guys like Happy Console Gamer, Isha Gaming, Super Derek, um, you know, guys that really put a lot of work into actually playing these games and coming up with really balanced reviews. I like uh, Eric Landon RPG, you know, he makes all these lists of RPGs, uh, you know, that are the best of this system or the best of that system. And I have actually gone out and bought, in multiple situations, in multiple cases, I've gone out and bought two or three of the games off of those lists, those top tens and things that he's done. And I have been very happy with those games. So I can now trust that when he says a game is good, I know that I'm going to like that game. And the same goes for Super Derek. And the same goes for Isha Gaming. And, you know, several others out there. Uh, RGT85, for example, uh, you know, I like the kinds of games that they like. And when they actually talk about a game and tell me what they feel about a game, I am way more motivated to play that game than just, you know, reading a tweet from Metacritic or something about how XYZ new game is doing, uh, you know, literally a day or two after launch when people couldn't possibly have played the game enough to really have a concrete opinion. And there are so many agendas floating around out there these days. So guys, what do you think about the review situation? Like, are these are these massive, you know, games journalism websites, uh, you know, are they going to last? Uh, do you pay attention to them? Let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, not only about the review situation, but about the games I'm about to get into in the next uh, week or two. Have you played them? What do you think of them? 
And, uh, yeah. Anyways, guys, thanks for sticking around for this kind of casual ramble. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Stay classy.